Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Cassandra Mangione. She's here to talk about all things bookish, cats, coffee, and writing, and just what her life is like today, which is super exciting because she is kind of the first guest that I know very little about, so this is kind of one of the reasons I started the podcast, and I'm really excited for her to be here today. So thank you so much, Cassandra. Why don't you say hello and introduce yourself? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name's Cassandra. I am 28, and I live in Simsbury, Connecticut with my husband and three cats. Um, their names are, my husband's name's Ian. I always go to my cats first. And my cats' names are Cosmo, Winston, and Quinn. Where do I start? I, I guess I, I grew up in the shoreline of Connecticut in Clinton, and I always found that I was making up stories and had a big imagination. So my mom decided to put me into theater when I was little because I would always be pretending and playing and theater, you know, welcomed a whole new perspective for me, new friends, all that stuff. So I did theater for a while and all throughout high school, I did all stage singing, but I also really love to write and be creative. So when it was time to decide for colleges, I had to choose between theater and English, two of my passions. And my grandfather gave me the advice to not do theater and to do something where I could, you know, get out of college and get a job. So I chose uh, journalism and English. And I went to CCSU in New Britain, loved it. That's where I met my husband. And Worked for the school newspaper there and got a job before I graduated in newspapers and then moved over to corporate communications. And now I work at Travelers in Corporate Communications. So just a little bit about me. <laughs> Hope that was okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So have you had a chance to keep theater at all active in your life? I know, of course, with the current state of the world, most likely not recently, but prior to March. Yeah, so I, when I graduated high school and went into college, I did try to get involved with the local theater there um, at, at school. But I just, for some, you know, I just really found a passion in journalism and writing and chose that. So from, you know, 2010 to, I think, yeah, 20, yeah, 2018, I, um, didn't do anything musical. I, I, I play guitar and I would, you know, play around with it every now and then, but nothing where I felt kind of felt that freedom, just the way that you feel when you perform. So I decided one day I was just going to reach out to random community theaters in my area. At the time I was living in Farmington, which is not too far from Simsbury. And someone from West Hartford community theater contacted me and, um, said that they would love to get to know me, have me join their theater. So I did one show, Young Frankenstein, two years ago, and it was amazing. And since then, I've been, you know, making new friends, doing different performances. Um, we perform at Blueback Square in West Hartford. We have music nights, which I really love, where we all get together and just, like, have drinks and just, you know, sing show tunes, all that stuff. And I'm also a very avid uh, theater goer. I love going to shows. The Bushnell uh, in Hartford has amazing shows. The Palace, my husband and I would go to like, you know, 10 shows a year, maybe, you know, sometimes more. It's just, I, I love it, you know, Broadway. So that's something I really miss. Like sometimes I'll, um, I'll play the sound of an orchestra warming up to calm me down because it's such an amazing sound. And I really, it's just like, I just have like this raw feeling when I think about how much I miss theater. But what I do love is that different Broadway actors are providing different avenues for us to experience theater, whether it's, you know, doing little mashup videos or like live performances virtually. So I've been tuning into those 
but it's hard. It's hard to, you know, be away from something you love so much. Right. It's definitely something that we're all finding new avenues for different things. Now, you said that your husband comes along with you uh, to all of your theater performances. Does he also enjoy theater? Was he also musical? How how did you meet him? So my husband was also in the English department in our undergrad. So I met him my freshman year of college. And we were friends for about a year. We met in English class. And we um, met in English class. We hit it off. You know, we would text each other when we, quote unquote, forgot the assignments, you know, just to like talk with each other. And we were both um, leaders on the campus. So I was I became editor in chief of the school newspaper. And he was the president of the interresidence council. So he kind of ran all the dorm rooms, that kind of stuff with different programs and ways to keep the students engaged so that they didn't go home on the weekends. So we kind of grew in leadership and we were friends, but then, you know, blossomed to a couple and we've been together for nine years almost. So, um, and married for five, but what I really did like about Ian is how we have a lot of common interests, including theater. He played the clarinet. So, and, and he would play in the pit for his shows. So, you know, he loved theater and played, you know, played music for, whereas I was on the stage performing it. So we had that nice connection and, we really hit it off because, you know, I remember we were driving the car and a song from Fan to the Opera came on and we were both singing it, you know, and I was like, you know what, this is this is perfect, right? It's a perfect partner. So we love going to the shows together, getting dinner. That's something I totally miss. Can't wait to do that again. That's awesome that your partner is so like similar in both of those uh, disciplines, that it's not oh, like we're both big English buffs and then I'm also really musical and, and you're not. So that's right. super exciting that that you have both of those commonalities. Yeah, we um we have over 700 books in our house. <laughs> um, and we're just, you know, avid readers. We love doing the crossword together. Just everything nerdy. We're just very compatible. It, 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 was, it was nice to have you know, this relationship grow out of a really good friendship that was already built on trust and, and just like compatibility. So it just, it was great that it naturally flowed into what it is now. <laughs> I'm curious about these 700 plus books. Do you, <laughs> do you have a catalog for them that you know how many there are? So that actually is a great idea. I don't, but I should. Ian's grandfather actually had his own, his own Dewey Decimal System. It is how, like, we have some of his books, and it has his own written, like, catalog for, we have a copy of his, like, an old Jane Eyre copy. And we actually have our own embossed stamp. So when you open the book, it ha it says, like, the library of Ian and Cassandra Mangione. So... I don't know why. I think I think I counted them before we moved. That's how I know. But then I know I've acquired more books in the last five months since I've lived here. So I know it's well over what I originally counted when we moved in back in June. I'm just that type of person where I have to have a book. I'm a print person. I love it. I have a Kindle. I always forget to charge it. Whereas a book, you can just open it and there it is. I love all any genre. Not really a romance person but any you know it, it's hard because I you know I'm very much like a, a hype person so I have a an account on Instagram uh, called like a bookstagram so a year ago I decided you know what like I'm reading a lot and like posting on my personal Instagram like this book was great five stars and like who really cares about that <laughs> my regular followers and I somehow stumbled across a couple of people who had bookstagrams and I was like, this is interesting concept. So I started a year ago and, and, and I actually transitioned my personal account just into uh, the bookstagram account because I found I was just posting about books anyways. Like that's my, that's what I want to post about. So I might as well just make it what my account is. And so starting the bookstagram, I've definitely acquired more books based on, you know, publishers sending them my way to read, to review or just buying them because I see other people reading them. <laughs> so 
So that's that's the story of the books. So how does the the bookstagram work? Like, what are you doing on Instagram? How did how did you get into that, and what does that mean? The bookstagram, I think, it's it's a it's a hard way to explain explain exactly what it is because I think it's different for each individual person. So it's a community on Instagram of bookish people from all over the world. I feel like Bookstagram is very focused on aesthetics in terms of the pictures, right? You put a, a book next to a really nice looking, you know, scone and a, and a latte and, you know, people love it. People go nuts. A lot of people go on there just for pretty book pictures, but from what I've found over the last few months is that it's also a really tight-knit community of people who have empathy and care about each other and want to make friends and talk about books and laugh about books, but also talk about other things. I found, you know, when the, when the topic of racial equity has come up over the last few months, big accounts have really stepped up in terms of sharing resources and ways to get involved and fight against racial injustice. When someone from Bookstagram is is going through a hard time, we all come together and donate or we send them care packages. You know, so it's for me it's more than me, you know, reading a book and posting a review or, you know, working with publishers to get advanced readers copies and help promote the book. It's also you know, a world that's in my pocket of people who care. You know, I talk to, there's people I talk to every day, all day, more than I talk to, you know, friends that I've made throughout my life. You know, these are really, really good friends that we share common interests and they, you know, care and they remember things. And it's just, it's just a really cool community. I'm glad I found it because it's really kept me grounded this past year. Yeah, I'm sure definitely in times of stress and pandemic, it's been a great outlet. Yeah. So turning a corner, I want to go back to something you said in your introduction that you have three cats. Can you talk about your your fun cats? So I never anticipated becoming a cat lady. I would make fun of cat ladies. I would be like, oh, cats are so mean. And then one day, I decided, you know, we decided, um, but I was the one to bring bring it up, that I really wanted a little kitten. And this was three years ago. And we found this really cute boy kitten. His name was Percy at the time, a little brown, you know, little brown and gray, you know, striped little tabby. And I said, we should get him. And so we got him. We named him Cosmo because that name's hilarious. And I fell in love with him. And a few weeks later, we brought him to the vet, you know, for the checkup. And the vet was like, she's doing great. She's very healthy, whatever. And I was like, oh, no, no. Cosmo's a boy. And (laughs) And the vet was like, no. That it's a girl kitten, and I said, "Are you sure?" And the vet was like, "I'm a vet. Yes, <laughs> I'm very sure that you have a girl cat." So we brought her home and kept the name Cosmo because it's still hilarious. Um, and she's been a wonderful companion. You know, I, I sometimes with cats, you kind of get what you get. You don't know what you're gonna get, and she's been snuggly and loving and fun and playful, no, no issues. So then if, when we moved into the house, she was kind of just like moving around, looking kind of sad. And I was like, you know what, maybe we should get her a friend. This is a big house. Like we can get another cat. So I, you know, do my usual search and I found this cute little boy kitten, little black kitten named Aaron. So Ian and I go to pick up Aaron (laughs) and this little tiny cute cute girl kitten just kept on staring at us following me around coming up to me rubbing up against me and I was like oh god like we're gonna we're about to take two kittens home so we did and but we found out that the that the girl kitten and the boy kitten were bonded pairs they you know like we opened up the crate and she went in the crate with him 
Like you don't you don't take the kitten out of the crate. So we brought them both home, named them Winston and Quinn. Um, we call Winston Winnie. And they're just the complete opposite of Cosmo, all over the place, causing trouble. But they're really good. And I'm so glad we got them. They're they're way more snuggly than I thought that they would be. And they're just so cute. They're just so cute. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know when this happened. I became a cat person. Like I've started receiving cat gifts. Also gifts for my cat, for me. So like my birthday, I'll get gifts for my cat, not gifts for me, for my cat, um, which is fine. But yeah, I mean, I still love dogs, but now I have, you know, three cats at home. <laughs> But it's been a it, like again like during this pandemic, it's been a real source of joy to have two new kittens and watch them grow. And so yeah. Do you have plans to get more cats, or eventually get a dog, or what's in what's the plans for the future? Uh, we're gonna keep these three cats, and that's it until we need to get more pets. <laughs> Hoping that they all three of them live long lives. Yeah, definitely no more animals in our future. Though I still look, because why wouldn't you? <laughs> that can be a, a dangerous thing to do, to look when you're not intending to purchase. <laughs> well, the problem is I'm really close with the woman who fostered Winston and Quinn. And she just, she just fostered an entire litter of these cute little, pe- like the littlest kittens and the mom. Every kitten got adopted, and the mom still hasn't got adopted yet. And the mom's only one. And I'm like, Ian, we have to get this cat. And he's like, we're not getting any more. No. So maybe I'll get another one. We'll see. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Three is enough. Three is enough. Yeah. So you've mentioned a couple of times that you moved recently. And mm-hmm. so... Can you explain what it was like moving in a pandemic and what has been different since you've moved? Sure. We lived in Farmington in an apartment for five years and I loved it. You know, we both loved it, but we knew we wanted to get a house and we were both home. And typically my husband is a um, national uh, soccer referee. So he's, you know, when he's not working full time, he has another job that he's never home. And for me, you know, I'm in grad school and I'm working full time and I'm doing the show and, you know, whatever. Um, So we were both home and could not do the other things that we usually do. So I said, okay, you know, we sat down, we said, this is the great, this is the greatest opportunity to start looking and, and, and saving and being serious about it. And we've been saving for a while, but this was the time to actually start looking at houses so we reached out to a realtor and we spent three or four weekends looking at houses we know we had a an extensive list of you know what we wanted what we didn't want where you know that kind of stuff and made sure you know it was it was such an interesting experience you know we had to wear masks sometimes you know it was required to wear gloves which was fine by me sometimes we had to take our shoes off at the house which I did not like at all walking around another, you know, another person's house just with your socks. You know, we would look on Zillow and a house that we would like would end up just getting purchased like within that day. So it's like, Oh, that house is nice. Can we go look at it? And the realtor is like, sorry, it's already received like eight offers and not accepting anymore. It's like, okay. So that was interesting watching just like the boom of it, like people just, you know, and I know that a lot of people were coming in from New York and buying houses and just kind of taking over. And and from what I understand, it's still a pretty tough market right now. But we looked in West Hartford, which is a really popular town, which is where those houses were just getting purchased the same day. We also looked in Glastonbury, Connecticut, Simsbury. I believe that's it for the towns that we actually toured houses in. I was very dead set on living in West Hartford, but we never found a house that we liked. And in Simsbury, 
we put an offer on a house that did not get accepted, um, which was heartbreaking. <laughs> but then a few days later, we came to this house and put an offer and then it got accepted. So what we really like about this house is that it was it was flipped before we bought it. So everything was new. The yard is gigantic, which is kind of troublesome when you need to mow it or rake leaves. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's nice because we kind of have our own space and privacy and we just have so many ideas to make it our own so we've been slowly doing that and it's been a really good positive distraction during the during what's going on and focusing on that and kind of nesting as we're all staying at home and staying safe yeah it's definitely been an experience and depending on like what your financial situation is like houses will always go immediately right. but it sounds like you found the right home it's just made of you know bumps along the way so that's always exciting and you showed me before we started the the fireplace and the yeah. built-in bookshelves <laughs> and so it seems like a great place yeah, it's sold like the this room specifically sold me because of the built-ins for my books and it's a it's a really nice whitewashed fireplace with shiplap. It just it just kind of fit our style, which is kind of like farmhouse. Um, yeah, and and I think no matter where when you buy a house, you're going to run into those competitiveness, those the situations where you're kind of you get your heart broken a little bit, <laughs> but the right one always comes along. Definitely. So you mentioned that you're working on your masters. Can you? Yes explain what you're studying and what you're doing for that. Sure. Um, so I went back to CCSU to earn my master's in English because I wanted to, but I also <laughs> really love talking about books and writing about books. And I was working in PR and communications when I decided to go to school part-time. So since 2017, I have been very slowly earning my master's while working full time. It's very challenging to do both, but I love the subject. I love reading, talking about books, writing about books, like I said. But right now I'm in the last chapter of my master's where I am finishing up my master's thesis. Um, which is focused on fantasy heroines and how they disrupt the narratives that are in their worlds. And I originally had a bunch of texts. I was going to look at the Chronicles of Narnia, Coraline, um, His Dark Materials, uh, Hunger Games, Harry Potter, but I kind of had to dwindle it down just to two because that would have been, you know, hundreds of pages. So right now it's, it's not right now. This is my thesis. It's on um, Katniss and Hermione. And what I, what I look at is the evolution of the girl hero in children's literature. And then in my case, fantasy literature. And the argument is that they've always been disruptive from Joe March and or Anne Shirley, you know, they they have always kind of stepped out of that societal role that was expected of them and and disrupted those narratives and helped save, you know, their town from something or just were true to themselves. So it it looks at the thesis looks at how they do that in their stories and how they also establish their agency in the process. But what it also looks at is how when they are at the cusp of, you know, when they're about to enter womanhood, they kind of regress and go back to the traditional norms that they were once rejecting in their childhoods. So like Joe March, for example, is, you know, this boyish, bookish girl who doesn't want to marry and who is a writer and would rather go off to war and fight with her father than stay home and knit like a pokey old woman, she says. 
And she does that. But once she becomes a woman, she ends up getting married, you know, and, and you kind of go like, ah, oh, like, and you see that, you know, you, you think that in the 21st century, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see that still in books, but you, you still see women being kind of forced to do that in their stories. So that's kind of where my thesis ends. So it's like, you know, and then I didn't get, I didn't get that realization until my, right now I'm kind of in my last round of edits where I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> This isn't like a positive thing. This isn't a positive thesis. We have these, you know, young girls who want autonomy and yet they kind of, you know, kind of give it up at the end. Like why you know, and these are written, you know, these those two books, you know, Hunger Games and Harry Potter are written by women. Like why why is why is it like that? So my thesis looks at examines the why and kind of questions, you know, even in fantasy where the genre is supposed to be limitless. Why are there still limitations for girl heroes? Yeah. And with both of those books, um, cause they are books that I have read. Um, they both like people, I don't want to say it's the fans, but they obsess over their romantic interests. And it's Absolutely. Like, that's not the point. It doesn't matter if Katniss ended up with Gail or with Peta, Hermione, Technically wasn't the main character, but she really stole the show because Harry was not the brightest tool in the shed. No. But but like people care about their relationship. And I'm sure like that's, you know, part of the whole story that that's a very traditionalist role to look at with women. Absolutely. And I'm glad you read it. I was I wasn't gonna and and to people listening, I I'm trying not to spoil anything, but you know, it, you kind of like like you said, it it does have to do a lot with you know these two protagonists are very popular in mainstream culture. You know, the team Gale, team Peta, the same thing with Twilight. You know, though I I specifically chose not to even look at Twilight for my thesis, but anyway. So you know, just the focusing on the romantic relationships rather than focusing on what that protagonist is doing to you know, use her voice and find her, discover her identity and, and, and take control of her story. Very interesting, very multi-layered, which is hard in a thesis because you're supposed to be very succinct. So <laughs> it's been a challenge. Yeah, it sounds like it, but a good one to tackle. And even as you said, to be going through it and in the last round of edits kind of being like, wait, this is where it's actually going. I need to add all these, you know, extra pages. And it's hard too, especially with, you know, being a fan of those texts myself and coming to those realizations that they aren't what they're supposed to be and what people try to make of them. It's very disappointing. But also just, you know, criticism around the authors who write the books. It's been hard to complete this and and but it's also good that I'm criticizing the text. It does help that as I'm finishing it. Yes. Now, is your goal to become a writer yourself? I would love to just write all day about whatever I wanted. I really do. See, I have the two passions in my life, which is, you know, I really do love communications and public relations, journalism. Those those three areas have always been a passion of mine. Ever since I was little, I would write stories, interview people. I was part of the, you know, the school newspaper and like interviewed my, you know, fourth grade teacher. Like I love hearing people's stories and writing stories. And with my master's, what I would love to do is keep my, keep my, you know, two passions, which is, you know, keep my job where I work now and also have the opportunity to be an adjunct professor and also kind of do what I'm doing with my thesis is look at texts and criticize them and write in academic journals, contribute to books, just write all the time. That's what I want to do. I would love to write my own books one day. I'm actually working on my own project, which is kind of writing about my life. It's more of a 
therapeutic exercise, more so something I intend to publish, and just because it's so personal, just looking at kind of where I've been and and understanding, because I, I, I grew up and still have a lot of anxiety and depression. So it's just kind of looking at where and how and kind of working through those different moments in my life, kind of as like a coping thing. But yeah, that's, it, it's just, I would love to write young adult children's books that don't have romantic interests and is just about a girl who goes on adventures and succeeds in her quest. And that's about it. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a lot that I, that I, I do want to do. Well, but you've got a lot of time ahead of you, so mm -hmm. you can follow those different paths. So you mentioned, you know, you're writing about your life. Is there something in your life, an event or anything that really sticks out for you with with just anything, really? Yeah, I, I, I'm at this point in my little project where I'm looking at my college experience because I had an amazing college experience. I had the opportunity to get involved with many things on campus. And one of them was um, going to France with uh, my journalism class to cover the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Um, we also went to Paris, so it was kind of like a very serious slash fun trip. And it was my first time going out of the country. I was so excited. And one of the days we were able to go to Omaha Beach. And it was incredible being there. And we're standing on the beach on the anniversary of D-Day and I look around and there are these, you know, there's veterans all around who are you know, taking pictures and putting wreaths down. It was so hot. <laughs> and we go into the parking lot at the end of the ceremony and I still didn't have a story. A lot of people were, you know, on the beaches, you know, for my class doing interviews. And I was like, I still don't know what to write about. And I, was with my classmates and, you know, we ended up talking to this older gentleman and um, his grandson. We were waiting, they were, we're all waiting for the buses. Like there was some kind of miscommunication and we're all just waiting in the shade because it was super hot. And I said, you know, we were talking and we're like, oh, where are you from? And the grandson said, uh, you won't know it. Glastonbury, Connecticut. Have you ever heard of the place? And we were, you know, I remember just our class, like me and my class was just like shouting, like, oh my gosh, like we're from Connecticut. How, you know, what are the odds of running into these people? It's just like, you know, very serendipitous. So I ended up getting the contact information for the, from the grandson. And I met with this veteran. His name's Bernie, Bernie Rader. And I met him at his grandson's house for lunch. And it was the best experience. It was, you know, he is the sweetest man. And I learned about his, I just heard his story. You know, he wanted to join the war when he was 17, too young. So he was 19 years old. He was finally able to enlist. And his friend, he told me his friend, he couldn't see well. But he was also a sniper, but I don't, I don't, it's fine. But he, he said that um, his friend was whispering the letters to him during the eye test so he can get in. He ended up being captured as a prisoner of war and he was Jewish. So he actually was, he was wounded and he asked his, um, one of his friends to bury his dog tags when he was captured. So, you know, cause he was afraid of being captured by, you know, the Germans when he was Jewish and he just had an incredible story. And, and he was part of the ceasefire in exchange of the prisoners of war. And he just had so many amazing stories. And, you know, I sat there, you know, I had my recorder going and I was writing notes 
getting ready to write the article for class. And I was like, you know, these are the stories that I want to write about. You know, I want to hear people, like, you know, that's why I really I was excited about this podcast because I just want to hear what people have to say. And there doesn't have to be a specific topic because everybody has a story, you know, what comes out of it, you know? So that was something that, ex, that entire experience, um, that trip, going to the beaches, then going to Drancy, which was one of the concentration camps in France. And just seeing those things and learning about those things. And now the concentration camp over there is, is apartments. And I just thought that was so interesting that, you know, here we, I remember ask, you know, remember asking, you know, why are they apartments? And, and the answer was like, you know, we had to, we needed them for housing. Whereas here we would never use them as, you know, like we just preserve history so differently. So it it was a really amazing experience and something that I, I I'll you know it's it's currently being written about in my project. So it made me think of that moment. And I actually just reached out to Bernie the other day because I haven't heard from them and I wanted to check with them during pandemic and make sure everything was okay. I mean, he still rides the convertibles at the Memorial Day parade and he was going to the gym every day. So He's just a, I'm, I'm very happy to know him. He sends me books, you know, I'm happy to know him. That's so awesome that you like happened to run into him and his grandson and then were able to get all those stories and, and continued, you know, a, a lifelong friendship and just kind of, you know, checking in and all of that. That's, I, I'm really happy that you, you shared that story. Thanks. So have you gotten a chance to, you know, hear from other people and like continue the journalism aspect that you were experienced in college where you got to hear other people's stories and write about them? Or since you've switched more into the corporate communications world and PR, have you kind of left that aspect for now? I have left it for now, which which I was realizing, you know, preparing for our talk today that I, I miss it. Just that, you know, I, right now we don't get a lot of, you know, human connection. It's very, it's very virtual and very hard to do that. Um, but I do miss that type of, you know, the type of format where you're sitting down with somebody and hearing, hearing their story, hearing them talk about something that's important to them. I do miss that aspect. And I like that type of writing too. So who knows, maybe one day I'll get back into that. Yeah. With all of my guests, I ask a fun, really random question. Your question's going to be kind of really specific and might seem random to the listeners, but when we were scheduling this interview, you kept talking about having to pick up a pie before we started recording. So my question is, what is your favorite kind of pie, and what was so important about this pie that you had to pick up? All right, so the pie collecting was... In relation to my home buying process. So I guess when you buy a house with this company, this realtor company, they end up giving you a free pie around the holidays. So we got an email to, you know, pick out a pie and come pick it out, you know, pick it up. And I said, uh, you know, obviously we're going to jump at this opportunity. And we got an app. It's like an apple walnut sour cream pie. Um, it looks delicious. We had to drive to go get the pie, and it was in this cul-de-sac neighborhood. And you pull up and you say your name, and they give you the pie. And we also got two donuts and kettle corn. So that was amazing. Those two donuts are gone, and the kettle corn's delicious. But so that's you know when you buy. I mean, if I knew, I would have purchase two houses so I can get two free pies, but maybe next year. My favorite pie has to be pumpkin pie. Yeah, pumpkin pie with lots of whipped cream. Really like pie is just like this, like the foundation which holds whipped cream for me. Um, But I do love apple pie with ice cream. 
Uh, that just, it all sounds very delicious. And I, I'm glad you could share that little fun story for the end here. <laughs> very interesting to pull out. You know, I didn't know, we didn't know what to expect. We're like, well, how do we get this pie? We're like, whoa, it's a whole fair of realtors just handing out free food. Um, yeah, I kind of assumed, because I didn't ask, I was like, oh, she's got to pick up a pie. <laughs> I kind of just assumed it was like for some fundraiser or something that a fundraiser was selling pies. She purchased the pie. There was a certain time to pick it up, let alone like a real estate agent. Like that's just something like you will remember. And, right. you know, if you decide to buy a house again, you need another realtor. Be like, do you still do the pie thing? Do you, before we get any further, will I get free pie? And to my husband's point, it wasn't necessarily free pie. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and I had to make a big investment to get this pie. But no, they were a great group to work with. So it was it was really nice to kind of, you know, it really brightened up my day to see people, you know, handing out treats and stuff. And of course, you know, with masks and outdoors, socially distant. But yeah, it wasn't a normal, you know, going to the bakery to pick up a pie. <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will be linking Cassandra's Instagram in the description along with her blog as well. So you can feel free to check that out. If you would like to connect with the podcast on social media, the links are in the description, including the Instagram and Facebook. I encourage you to go give those pages a like. And the podcast is also on YouTube. So obviously, if you are listening to this, in the podcast universe, you are just getting an audio version, but the YouTube version does include closed captions and a link to the entire podcast as well in text format. So that always comes out the weekend after the recording. So I encourage you if you need to, or if you want to share the podcast with someone who might not know podcasting format, that YouTube is a little bit more accessible for the general public. And also we have a Patreon. So if you would like to support the podcast monetarily, there is that option as well. So thank you, Cassandra, so much for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week, bye. Bye, everyone.